Yeah, just let him know. I think it will go equally well, perhaps better after the sermon. So, <laughs> again, a warm welcome to all of you. So, I usually start the sermon with a little personal story, and today is no different. I've always wanted a lemon tree. And a few years ago, Macon gave me one for Mother's Day. I'm not sure why Macon had to be the one to give the Mother's Day present. I've, <laughs> but, you know, this is how it gets. So I keep it in a pot on the deck. I tend to it. I fertilize it. I bring it inside during the winter so it doesn't freeze. Now, this year, it's produced a lot of leaves, but pretty much zero flowers, and I think there might be one or two very green, small lemons, which sort of look like lime on it. So when there was an early freeze threat in this October, I thought, it's time to bring this tree inside. And of course, uh, we put it in the living room, and immediately it started losing leaves. I could tell it was extremely unhappy. But I figured once I'd moved it inside, there was no point in putting it back outside, even though the weather this fall has been really glorious. There's been day after day, I mean, until this morning, it's been sunny and warm and incredibly delightful in Chattanooga. So finally, even though I dreaded picking up this pot, I thought, yes, I better give this lemon tree another chance. I put it back outside. And within a week, it started to flower and also put forth all these new little lemons. All kinds of new life had just been waiting to burst forth. And so it goes. Will you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our scripture lesson this morning promises that the days of God's people will be like the days of a tree. Apparently, the author of this later section of Isaiah is referring to a tree's unique ability to grow back after being cut down to the stump. In the book of Job, it says, for there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grows old in the earth, and its stump dies in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth branches like a young plant. This section of Isaiah is written in the context of the return of the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem. The Jewish leaders who were in captivity had suffered. Those who remained in Jerusalem had suffered. The chapter begins with God's reminder. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask to be found by those who did not seek me. The people had turned their backs on God. Nevertheless, God plans to do a new thing, to renew the heavens and the earth, to forget the past and to move forward. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, God tells God's people. And what is described here might sound like a utopia. I don't know how carefully you paid attention to that scripture reading, a place where the wolf and the lamb feed together. And sometimes it's pretty hard to believe a place like this could exist. A place of justice, where the fruits of labor benefit the workers. A place of universal health care, from the NICU in the maternity ward to the nursing home a place where old and young alike can thrive, a place of safe neighborhoods and good education for all, a 
place where the earth is cared for and valued. Yet it's hard to believe as this is, this is the very place that God describes in this passage from Isaiah. The place that God says is being created even as we speak. Now this week I had the opportunity to tour the restoration village that is being created in Chattanooga. You remember when we collected coats last winter for that organization, Help Right Here? Two teachers, I guess a teacher and a librarian over at CSAS down the street had started this organization because they had such a passion for helping unhoused people. A year ago, this village was a dream. And I can't wait to tell you what I saw when I went there this week. 30 people now live in this community on what was just a vacant lot in downtown Chattanooga. Donations of tents, blankets, and pallets have allowed each person to create a kind of home. One man I spoke with has individualized his tent with all sorts of found objects. He, he roams around Chattanooga during the day and he picks up things that other people consider trash. He has a porch light on his tent, a back deck, and even a picket fence. And he delights in inspiring the other residents of the community to create their place. He said to me, what if instead of we can't, we said, we can. The village is governed by a community council of residents. A couple of friendly pet dogs roam around. They have yoga on a weekly basis, church on Sunday afternoons, AA meetings, a free store where our contributions of warm clothing will go. There's a common living room under the tent for games and chats. They have a communal kitchen and a garden. And all of this is created from donations, temporary shelters, tires used for planting beds. Morgan, you will not like this, but a system of extension cords brings power <laughs> to the residents. And by the way, when I asked, because I thought our congregation might want to know what is their greatest need right now, it is more long extension cords, <laughs> three prong types. Don't go there, Morgan, you will not be happy. But all of this, all of this that I saw is created by love, by God, by God's love working in people. Springing forth from an old lot to create a new community. Now, is this place a utopia? Okay. Probably not. <laughs> and a few difficult issues have come up amongst the residents. But by and large, it's a harmonious place where love imagined has become reality. And the good news this morning is that God is always trying to create through love. The question is, how will we participate? How do we get in on what God is already doing? God is always inviting us to help in this great project of creating on the holy mountain. Now, sometimes we might feel like we're going it alone spiritually or for whatever reason, and there are so many, Trying to seek religious insight in a group or taking part in a church might feel just difficult for us. And anything that involves human relationships is bound to get messy at times. But with others in community is where the Holy Spirit shows up in these relationships, in these settings. And it's important to note the saving action is for a community, not an individual, not a family, but a community. For God's community as we come together. 
Now today, as I said earlier, is Stewardship Sunday. And it's a day when we consider what new thing God is doing in this church community. This year, this December, I believe it's December 6th, some of the folks who've been in this church longer than I have can correct me if I'm wrong. This December marks the 107th anniversary of this Pilgrim Congregational Church experiment. Over the years, this church has stood for justice in Chattanooga. This church was the first mainline church in the area to show leadership in integration and racial equality. Dr. McCravey was recalling to me the other day how in the 1950s, he used to sneak down as a boy and see Arnold Slater, Reverend Arnold Slater, who was the minister here for almost 30 years, holding meetings with black faith leaders in the basement of our church downtown. We were singled out for our stance on racial justice and a firebomb was thrown at the door of this church. A few decades later, Pilgrim was the first church in our area to become open and affirming. And some people left the congregation because of it. And if anyone out there doesn't know what open and affirming means, it means not just that we are open to LGBTQ plus people and welcome them in our community, but we affirm and positively support their lives as children of God. Wow, you wouldn't think that that would be such a hard one for churches these days, but it still is. And you might wonder what this Pilgrim Church is becoming now. So I want to share with you a little bit about what I see. I see a green shoot coming from the roots of love that were planted 107 years ago. A church that was reduced during the pandemic that is now growing. A few intrepid folks a couple years ago said, let's see if this Pilgrim Church can hang on. And the leadership of this church has been working hard over the last two years, nurturing our growth. And if you're, if you're on the church council, I want you to raise your hand right now. Church council, thank you for your leadership. Lisa, <laughs> put, put it up there. <laughs> this has been a difficult time. And the tireless efforts of this council have allowed Pilgrim to remain rooted in love. And if you reflect on what grew, it was this kind, supportive community during the pandemic on Zoom. Now, I don't know if my dad is here this morning. He's usually pretty faithful in his home. He has high dad and his Zoom attendance from Florida. And my dad doesn't usually, you know, he was a Navy Admiral, et cetera, et cetera. He doesn't usually show a lot of, you know, effusive emotion. But he did faithfully attend on Zoom all during the pandemic, and he still does today. And you know what he said to me? He said, you know, Kath, your church is very warm. Warm. He loves the part of the service where we share our joys and concerns with one another, one another because he can see that love that we have. And when we decided to recreate our sanctuary space to be more welcoming and versatile, that project unfolded with such harmony. Most churches would not have undertaken such a bold vision especially in a time of volatility and uncertainty. Yet I believe this vision was created by love. And I see God answering us before we ask. Before we ask, God gives the answer. When we didn't have a music program, love sent in Jim Bailiff. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. When we weren't sure about colors and choices for the new space, love sent in a graphic designer and an artist with their gifts and insights. 
when we weren't sure how we would keep the church organized and together when we came back to the building. Love, Sin, and Gail and Linda, and I hope they're here on Zoom. I know they're on their way to a funeral. I don't know where we would be without Gail and Linda. Two systems experts with hearts for service and faith in this community. And I just have to tell this bit because literally the day I was talking with Bryce and I'm like, what are we going to do about banners, impairments, everything's kind of old and we, you know, we could use some new stuff. Karen and Ross came for a visit and Karen volunteered. Catherine, I would like to make banners and pyramids for your church, <laughs> which would soon become her church. I'm so glad she did. And when Rex and I were kind of scratching our heads saying it would be nice if someone from the younger generation could help a little bit with the Zoom setup. Love sent in Morgan, who had experience running AV systems in other churches. And I could go on and name each one of you because you've each brought so much to this church. And love has sent each and every one of you here today. And if you're on Zoom, maybe you've never set foot in the sanctuary, but love sent you here today. Whether you were baptized and married here at Pilgrim, you've been coming here your whole adult life, or if you're new to this church or visiting for the first time today, love sent you here today. This is how a church becomes, with each person offering the unique gifts and talents that God has given them. Sometimes you're in a phase of life when all you can give is your occasional presence on Zoom or a quiet seat in the back of the sanctuary from time to time. It doesn't matter whatever you're able to give, God can work with it. It is enough. I had no idea what was in store when I took this position two years ago. Now I know. Love is doing a new thing here. Love is creating a community. Before they call, I will answer, says the Lord. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The pilgrim story is that story of love unfolding. And this is just the beginning of what we can do together. My sense is God is inviting us to extend our work in mission and outreach to the wider community. Perhaps to revive PFLAG or host a support group for transgender people here at this church. To build on the kinds of open-minded conversations that have been going on in Bible study and adult Sunday school each week. Places where people with different points of view can disagree while holding regard, respect, and love for each other. We have a vision for a theater in the fellowship hall, a place where meaningful and provocative plays may be performed, a place where we can connect with the Glenwood neighborhood. We have a vision for a children's program that will grow and nurture our children with an understanding of God's love and affirmation of them. We don't know what's next, but I do know God is doing a new thing here. And as long as we as a community 